Welcome to The Gray Report. I'm your host, Spencer Gray. And if you are a multifamily investor, any kind of real estate investor, or you're working in the multifamily industry, well, The Gray Report is the YouTube show and podcast for you. We're covering all the latest research reports, data points, throwing out some original commentary every single week. Um, so make sure you're subscribed to The Gray Capital YouTube channel. You're checking out the podcast. Matt Bosnagel, Director of Communications and Marketing here at Gray Capital, is here to break it all down. we got a lot of really interesting stories to discuss. CPI uh, inflation data has come out from the BLS. We're looking at rents that are rising at the highest rate since 1981, along with inflation. we got disastrous rent control policies in Minneapolis, St. Paul, we want to talk to. Absorption, though, is down, according to CoStar, and we have a national rent report from Yardi. A lot of good stuff to get into. You're going to watch the whole episode. Leave a comment, subscribe. Let's get into it. All right, welcome back to The Gray Report. Matt Bosnagel, Director of Communications and Marketing. Matt, it has been a incredibly busy week. We've got a lot of stuff going on here at Great Capital, I know. Yep. You've been slammed. You still were able to put down an excellent, excellent report. A lot of good information. You're going to want to watch this whole video, but also make sure you are signed up for the Gray Report newsletter. You can go over to graycapitalllc.com. That's graycapitalllc.com. You can put a slash newsletter letter. It'll take you directly there. You'll get these research reports, articles, and a, a whole lot more sent to your inbox every single week, free of charge. It has been known as the best multifamily newsletter, at least in the Northern Hemisphere that I'm aware of. I don't know. Maybe the Southern oh, I thought, Hemisphere. I thought you were going to say all recorded history. Uh, yeah, well, that's, that I, I know of. But just <laughs> if we're going off the facts, you know, we know. Anyway, that's right. that's so true. let's get right into the report, Matt. Um, so the Washington Post, this is coming off of the BLS reporting CPI data that came out um, just this week. Record um, CPI inflation from June. It's also corresponding with um, you know rent growth. We're seeing basically the highest levels of inflation in growth since really the past forty years, since nineteen eighty one. Incredible. Um, Washington Post put out an article. Um, what are some of your takes? And break it down for us. Yeah, I. Uh I will admit there's like a, a certain strain of anxiety that's carried forward from the bigger than expected employment numbers in last week's job report. And I was like, oh no, here comes the inflation report. And lo and behold, it was, you know, 9.1. Um, the heated the heated economy that was implied by that jobs report has really kind of carried over. Now we've got inflation. And now what's going to happen next is going to be a Fed. Uh, yeah. And let's let's break that down because yeah. it's, it's a little counterintuitive. I remember here um, at the office at, Gr at Great Capital HQ last week and, you know, on one hand, a uh, made huge jobs number. Um, you know, I think over 300,000 um, new jobs are created um, mm -hmm. just last month. That seems like a really good thing for the economy and that kind of uh, dispelled some in, uh, recession fears. But at the same time, for others, they saw it as a clear path to, to a recession because it's the clear signal that the Fed needs that there's no way that they can yeah. reverse course. Um, they've got to maintain their credibility, even if they believe. And there's a lot of discussions out there um, of you know how much weight we should put on you know this CPI report because it's from June with a lot of um, opinions that maybe we've seen peak inflation although yep. man how many times have we heard that because commodity prices have I come to down. Google that oh yeah. I was going to come up with ones last month that said oh we, we've probably reached peak we, inflation. we've reached peak inflation yeah. but seasonally that would make sense you know yeah. from a rental market and just in general we see a lot of the growth kind of through June in July and it either starts tapering off in July mm -hmm. or August. Um, so there's some seasonality to it, but wow, it's it's high and it's giving the Fed no other option but to increase their path of increasing the Fed funds rate, right, raising interest rates, which, you know, usually typically leads to a recession. Just quickly on that note before, Matt, we get more into the article. I mean, let's mm -hmm. just look at the, you know, the, the yield curve, the 10 year Treasury minus um the ten-year Treasury minus the uh, two-year Treasury. Um, this is going back, you know, pe you know, into the mid '70s. But you know, we can see that you know when the Fed, um, typically the two-year, you know, as the Fed raises the Fed funds rate, those shorter maturity um, rates also rise, and as interest rates rise, typically that's led to a recession. Um, and what happens when the two-year Treasury become yields higher than the ten-year Treasury? 
it doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's a correlation causation that that doesn't cause the recession, mm -hmm. but it is a it's a sign that has um, rung true, a warning sign, pretty consistently. Um, so when people are so when people are overvaluing the two year compared to the ten year, what is that prediction? Is that is that saying the next two two years are going to be better, but the next ten years are going to be worse? There's more people putting money into the two year, mm -hmm. um, sorry, into the 10 year note rather than the two year note. So it's driving down the yield. The prices are going up mm -hmm. for the 10 year treasury. It's decreasing the yield of the 10 year treasury, allowing that two year to to rise. People saying, I want to put my money away from the long term, keep it safe. Okay, okay. I'll take a lower yield. That's kind of what I was trying to But yeah. people are being paid more for having their capital, you know, so tied up, mm -hmm. you know, for two years rather than 10 years, which is incredible. And it, again, it has an idea that there's fear of a not great, a poor economic conditions in mm -hmm. the near term, who knows about the long term. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Ooh. So, you know, are we already are we already in a recession? That's a question that we've asked here on the great report multiple times. Yeah. Um, and again, are we, is it more of a technical recession of more relating to base effects? And you know, there's some committee out there that's going to tell us if we're in a recession or not. Right, I'm waiting on them. Yeah. Let's we'll see what they're going <laughs> to say. Um, because how can you be in a recession if we're you know, gaining so many jobs? Well, and that's, and that's what I was going to say too, is that um, the, the federal reserves mandate is, you know, they got to keep interest or they got to keep inflation under control and then they got employment. Yeah. Well, with those jobs numbers, that's like a green flag for getting inflation yeah. under control. Stable prices. OK, well, prices aren't stable, but yeah. our employment's figured out. So, yeah, we got to get these prices under control. The problem is the tools that the Federal Reserve has aren't necessarily going to affect the causes of inflation. And yeah. so the fear is, do we create a more stagflation environment? Where we still have high levels of inflation and price growth. But we just don't have your real economic productivity. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, I think that the jury's out somewhat uh, uh, about whether maybe we're in, in peak inflation. I think that that we are that it is a weird moment because it is kind of a lagging indicator. Um, Barry Ritholtz, who argues that we may already be past peak inflation, given the falling energy prices and commodities, said that the Fed should be looking at a 50 point basis point hike rather than 75 basis point. Now, he said that shortly before the numbers were released. And then in later in a later post, he said, we're very probably getting a 0.75 increase in the federal funds rate. <laughs> and there's a lot of people pushing for 100 basis points like, hey, wow. let's let's just deal with this now. Just let's just hike it up. If you're if the point here is to cool the economy and, yeah. and for like interest rate sensitive um, parts of the economy, mm -hmm. like why 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 wait it's, it's yeah, only 25 a, basis points different and mm -hmm. would you rather kind of shock the system with 100 basis points than having to do 275 basis points yeah you know spread out spread out over a longer period of time you know we still have some runway even compared to a couple of years ago just going to look up the fed funds rate um again over the past uh you know uh, decade um so i mean again we had a much higher fed funds rate um you know back in you know the early 2000s all the way up at five percent you know of course the fed funds rate um rose that's what caused all the issues in subprime mortgages all of a sudden people couldn't afford to refinance um, people were underwater they didn't qualify for the mortgages and bam went to the recession and housing crisis rates were so low for so many years again this is the fed funds rate in 2016 we started raising interest rates again this was um, you know, then really in 2018, where this started and this had a, people were having a lot of recession fears at this time, then the pandemic happened. Um, but again, going back to the, the 10 year minus two year, we did have that inverted yield curve yeah. just before the pandemic, completely unrelated to the pandemic, more related to these, um, uh, the Fed funds rates being hiked. We did have a recession. And now here we are um, in uh, in mid July. Now this is, I think, uh, maybe a little bit, a little bit dated, but we're at one one point two one percent of the Fed funds rate. Just back in two thousand and nineteen, we we're at two point three eight. Yeah. Um. So we've got some room to run now in the multifamily world, where this is throwing things on its head, and not just real estate, but other asset classes. Is that valuations have come so detached, and they were driven up so much by mm -hmm. the cheap money and low interest rates. We've seen it in the tech sector, a major revaluation with the new inflation data and different interest rates, the way that they value at, um, those technology companies. That is much, it's been moving much slower when it comes to real estate, um, especially multifamily, but just real estate in general. Yeah. It's a slower moving market. You don't get nearly as much price discovery. And unlike technology, um, 
which is a really deflationary force, you know, a real estate multifamily real estate in general tends to do very well in an inflationary environment. Mm -hmm. So, and there's so much, because there's so much rent growth and we're seeing that, but you know, where is that inflection point of, you know, the valuations being affected by interest rate, but on the other side, the argument of there's so much growth, you can grow out of it in the, to justify those valuations. And so there's a lot of interesting price discovery going on right now where we really don't know exactly where the market is, but will there be enough buyers at those, you know, 2021, January, 2022 prices yeah. to keep those cap rates at incredibly historic lows? It'll be interesting. Yeah, it is. It is interesting. And I do think that, that there will be some catch up um, for, for investors, for buyers and sellers in the, in the multifamily market on, on that side, because, you know, it's one thing to say, okay, let's put it into context. You know, interest rates were so much higher, but like that's that doesn't matter. The market has decided that they're, that they're really that, focused that's on true. the near term. That's true because it's, you, you could say like, well, you know, we had higher interest rates, five, you know, almost five percent Fed funds right back in two thousand six, and on you know two, mid twos in two thousand and eighteen. You know, um, cap rates have to rise, but what we didn't have in those two periods were double digit rent growth yeah. for more than one year. We're going to be going 24 months of double digit rent growth. We're essentially, we're seeing the amount of growth we would typically see in like a four year period or even longer than just a year or two. Um, cause typically we're seeing 3% rent growth on a year. Okay? Yeah. Well, we're getting, you know, 10 to 15%, depending on where you mm -hmm. are, even 20 to 30% in some markets. Yeah. So in how much, and this is where we're going to transition over to this CoStar report, but there's a lot of good data on the fundamentals mm -hmm. um, in terms of occupancy and rent growth. The demand, though, and it, that shows up in absorption, though, there's some data that has showed maybe some slowdown yeah. reverting back to kind of pre-pandemic um, levels. So let's let's just get into this CoStar report, Matt. Yeah. Um, multifamily rent growth across the country cools in Q2. I'm looking up at the window. Right <laughs> <laughs> so it cool, and so that this would this is not what buyers want to see if they are buying at a three or four cap right now. Yeah, I uh, I I think I just kind of pulled out this quote as a representative take of uh, of this CoStar report, and it says, "Combine the fact." that rent prices continue to sit at all-time highs with tempered com consumer demand and a record 450,000 uh, sorry 450,000 units expected to be delivered by year's end and you have a perfect re recipe for a sharp rise in vacancy rates in the next 6 months um i don't think that this report is ex is wrong in expecting slower rent growth but like as a matter of degree the rent cool down or vacancy increase they predict here may not be as dramatic as they're projecting um i i think that there's a lot of points in that quote itself really that uh that have some pretty strong counter arguments um for for one uh, you know i'm just tossing aside the the vacancy rates which actually are are not alarming and we'll see that in in a, a yardy matrix report later um the idea that the new supply is going to alleviate is going to really impact um, apartment demand. I'm not. I'm not entirely convinced um, because demand's so high, anyways. And also those factors that will impact the that will make those four hundred fifty thousand dollars. I'm sorry, four hundred fifty thousand units come online. Those factors are kind of recession dependent and inflation dependent. So they may not all come online if the economy doesn't do d do that well. But if they do, then that's kind of a it's kind of good news. I'm also wondering if how if uh, how absorption is being affected by the increase in renewal rates mm -hmm. as well, um, because you know a renewal I don't think really goes to count as absorption, and you we're seeing higher than average renewal rates. Um, I think you know uh, typically historic averages around a 50 percent kind of turnover or renewal rate at a multifamily property. Okay, um, I think we've looked at some data recently showing that in the last year or so it's closer to 60 percent. The reason that is people may, were considering moving. The rent has even on the renewal has been increased. They, they say they're going to move. They go out on the market. They see rents everywhere else are even higher than what they're paying. So they end up staying for a little bit longer, try to maintain that somewhat lower price point. So people are sticking put a little bit longer. Um, mm -hmm. And we're seeing in the single family home market as well. People don't want to give out, um, away those, um, you know, two, three percent uh, mortgage rates. So compared so occupancy. How much how much apartment units are filled out of the all the apartments in stock absorption is how much out of all the new apartments built well it's not just new apartments it's just new leases new leases okay yeah okay so the because net the existing increase, asset you know absorbs okay okay so the net increase in new leases and the number that they have for the past three quarters on this coaster report is sixty thousand 
Yeah. Now that is compared. So I think that that's really notable because it, the just for the fact that it's been three quarters in, in a row. Um, secondly, this quarter, uh, the, they measured the last quarter, quarter two, should be a little bit more elevated in, yeah. in terms of like seasonality. Yeah. Um, and then also we'll the bigger one. you look at the difference between the peak in um, in the first quarter of 2021 and the low point in the the la, uh, you know in the 60,000 and man it's like 200,000 different. Yeah, it's a it's a big it's a big difference. And again, even going back to 2018 and 2019, um we're still a little bit below um those those levels. Um in the Q2 of 2019, I mean, we were, you know, in the mid kind of 75,000 range. So, you know, we're yeah, we're, we're under below um, for sure. And so, again, how much of this is people staying put, not moving around? Um, it could also be you know, people moving in with each other. And that's not showing up in the occupancy data just yet. But what CoStar is alluding to and suggesting that is that the occupancy is really, you know, a lagging indicator in this absorption, maybe hmm. a leading indicator, potentially seeing potential lower occupancies over the next several months. Now, occupancies are at all time high, you know, across the nation. Yeah. You know, for, for, for the most part. So, you know, that 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 is not, I would say, too surprising. Mm -hmm. And um, show me the people who were arguing that we're going to have we were going to see 97 to 99 percent average occupancy forever. You know, I think that's a little bit of a pipe dream. And if you were underwriting to those assumptions, you're going to be in a bad spot, especially yeah. if you're also underwriting, you know, for continued rent record rent growth forever yeah and that's the challenge is where is that line what's reasonable what's speculating too much and what is not taking into account the record growth that we are actually seeing in reality yeah it's it's it is frustrating this is kind of the theme for it's like just because things are merely great instead of super incredible great you know that doesn't necessarily mean that things are are worse or bad it just means that they're not as incredibly great yeah. as, as 2021 um just to note the year over year rent growth that, that costar measures is 9.2 percent um down from 11.4 percent mm -hmm. um last quarter and um we'll see some different numbers measured from the cpi which which vary which calculates it differently i think this is probably market rent compared to yeah. cpi yeah 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 um, CPI, it's a completely different okay. metric yeah. yeah and then we'll see another number for um from the yardy matrix report mm -hmm. too so yeah. this is just one of many but they're all Elevated a lot more than yeah. I mean, still seeing you know record rent growth. I mean, up at the top um, year over year, and these are some selected markets. I don't think this is like a, an order list of all markets, but you know they've got Orlando um, grow is grown at eighteen point seven percent year over year rent growth. Um, you know you got markets like Salt Lake City at fourteen, Nashville at thirteen point nine, Dallas at thirteen, um, Vegas at twelve, and Indy at eleven point eight. Um, you know, Phoenix at 10. So, you know, you're seeing some movement around movement around in terms of markets that you may expect to be growing more. Um, the title of this graph is growth in the Sun Belt and South also slows, but still exceeds national averages. And I think maybe some of the points are making are some of the markets like Phoenix and the Inland Empire um, and even San Jose, and Las Vegas and Austin that we're seeing incredible, incredible rent growth. I mean, they're still seeing, again, blockbuster, you know, yeah. incredible uh, rent growth, but it is lower than it was. And you're seeing markets like Indianapolis or Cincinnati um, or even, um, you know, a Charlotte um, that are, you know, really starting to pick up some steam as well. Charlotte's always been gone. Yeah. A quickly. few weeks ago, we noted that, too. And it's in this is one of the one of the moments where like it you can get some insights from looking at the month to month figures and seeing kind of which markets are starting to break out um, yeah. and change their trajectory. Yeah. Trajection. Trajectory. <laughs> well, again, kind of go reverting back to the inflation story, but kind of relating it to rents, rents in the U S rise at fastest pace since 1986. Oh, did I say 1981 earlier? My bad. Well, that's the CPI. Oh, the CPI is 1981. <laughs> We're not rents there yet. Fastest place. Fastest pace since 1986. Um, so, at least in my lifetime, I've never seen this type yeah. of rent growth. Uh, more supply signs of a peak could ease market, Moody says, in a gap between rage growth and rent increases is narrowing. Yeah. Um, the 
big increase in this is a quote it says the big increase in cpi rents is catch up with the consistent double digit rent growth in market rents the good news is that market rents appear to be topping out as renters are not available to afford the higher rents and are balking more rental supply is also coming although this will take a year or two to have a meaningful impact on market rents um this quote, quote to be glib it, it, it's pretty legit um rent growth is cooling off that new supply coming online probably will take some time to be felt in the multifamily market. And we're getting to a point where things may be catching up kind of vis-a-vis -vis the, the mm. rapid rent growth for renters who are starting a new lease and renters as a whole, which includes the slower rent growth of renewals. Um, that being said, there's still room to grow, but we're like almost approaching a point where market rent growth is roughly parallel to inflation. And if inflation ticks up a little and rent growth cools off a bit, we really could be there. Um, and what's also really interesting is is if you take so if you take the categories of this this CPI report real rents not just market rents are increasing by 5.8% um year over year uh, that that's th that's the increase that yep. they make and that that's compared to the 9.1% year over year of total inflation um, but that 9.1 percent, as, we, as we've learned has a a lot to do with the huge increases in energy prices energy prices went up like 46 percent or something over over yeah. year over year and like 7.5 percent they've come down but yeah they, yeah, last they month. yeah from the last month yeah and so they've come down and 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 i think that rent growth given that rent uh, given that these other commodities and the gas prices are have come down kind of in the past two weeks i think rent growth is going to be even bigger force in the inflation calculation and that trend could be the secret ingredient for this per uh perfect re recipe for reduced vacancy that was uh that was mentioned in, in the coast our report. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that um, we will soon maybe even be at a place where rent is the driver of inflation instead of gas. You know, we always hear about that. The, that wasn't the headlines. Uh, well, you know, you we know, got inflation. It's because of gas. It, it's, a, it's a great point. And we, we, we talked about this last year as we were saying that everyone's when people were talking about peak inflation last mm -hmm. summer yeah. and we were saying, OK, yeah, I can understand on because at that time, everyone thought the supply chain issues maybe would be figured out. Mm. Um, but we were saying, OK, yeah, you get that figured out, but you see all this um, this absorption that's going to happen in terms of, you know, where market rates have gone and in place rents. There's going to be all this rent, effective rent growth that hasn't been baked. It has been baked in, but it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. And so we we knew when we can you can go back to episodes of the Gray Report from last summer or even prior saying that, you know, there's going to be a lot of inflation caused by rents and wages that just hasn't occurred yet. Yeah. And so to say that we're peak inflation last year, you just what you know, just um, they're missing. Um, they're missing the full picture. They're looking at one element, the one driver of inflation coming down, which is you know supply chain issues. You know, not to mention money printing and all of that. So the fiscal side had decreased. The monetary stimulus hadn't been decreased yet. So again, why would you think it was going to be slowing down? But at least the fiscal side was slowing down. Maybe we'll see some normalcy, but then you have all these other second and uh, secondary and tertiary effects, you yeah. know, whether it's rents rising, wages rising, and those spirals and those feedback loops that are created by one price rises mm -hmm. that has to be carried through eventually to wages and rents and rents to wages and then prices of other things. Yeah. And um, we're working through it right now. And again, the question of, you know, the Federal Reserve raising rates, what is raising the Fed? Fund, how is the Fed funds rate going to really solve really any of those, you know, major, yep. major issues other than causing a recession and uh, forcing people out of the labor force or layoffs to happen um, to really just to decrease employment and to try to um, put a resistor on uh, wage growth to yeah. limit it. Uh, you know, and, and I said this uh, a few weeks ago, it's like rent and housing rent. That is its own story in and of itself. Yeah. You know, I think that we could have been facing this to a lesser extent if there wasn't a pandemic, um, if there wasn't external inflationary forces that have that have kind of converged at this moment, there would still be a worry, I think. Yeah, well, because the housing crisis w w has been, you know, baking a decade or more yeah. in the making. And, you know, the pandemic, I think, accelerated it and then made the pain even worse at a short period of time and concentrated it. But, you know, there there's a couple articles that I, that um, that I, I was reading today also that, that didn't make into 
this episode of the great report but i'm one from npr you know really getting into the fact that we've had a housing crisis we've got a housing crisis Mm -hmm. and the pandemic didn't cause the housing crisis it kind of exposed the housing crisis itself so you're to your point matt we would have been having a lot of these problems already it's just we had that peak of absorption and demand last year that really kind of accelerated and and kind of i mean you know lifted the veil because Mm -hmm. we even saw this happening last year, but all the attention was on the single family home market and other parts of the economy, yeah. not really on the rental market. And only now is that kind of being discussed. I mean, I heard, you know, I heard Jim Cramer last night, you know, oh, on my really? drive home talking about, you know, these, these, these the landlords, they're, they're raising rent. I, I find this kind of comical, but they're raising rents. And he, I think he said it's, it, it's shameful because they're just raising rents. And I'm like, I, I don't see you calling other areas of the economy that are raising prices, you know, shameful. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's it's literally we didn't build enough. And a lot of it has to do with regulations and has to do with builders getting out of the market and has to do with demographics. But I mean, what do you expect an owner to do when your apartment is 99 percent, 100 percent occupied? Yeah. If people um, pay that price, then that's the market. It, and there is affordable housing mm-hmm. um, that it's focused on people who aren't able to afford market r- market um, rents. And then there's the market rate rental segment, which is m- driven by market forces. Yeah. And so to suggest that we should have an ulterior motive beyond providing housing at the market rate. That's a, just a different business model and has yeah. to be reoriented. But the market is what the market is. Doesn't mean you don't have you know some sort of compassion. You don't need to, you know, try to you know price price gouge. But at the same time, we're seeing payroll go up considerably. Utilities going mm-hmm. up. When we know property taxes are going to be going up considerably over the next couple of years as valuations have risen. So it's not like it's a free lunch and, you know, just apartment owners are, you know, stuffing cash into their pocket. Although it's been great. It's been great for the multifamily industry for the acquiring the right assets, the right time, financing it the right way. But, you know, some of those comments are a little disingenuous. Yeah, that's very confusing. Yeah. You forgot how markets work. For sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So rent growth and inflation explainer. Let's get I'm going to fast forward to the apartment list, Matt. So okay. why, why, why we're talking about yeah. um, inflation. Let's just we'll just stay on on that topic. Rent growth and inflation explainer. So they they're going to explain. Even though I think we just explained yeah. a little bit. Covers a lot of the let's uh, I, it, how does apartment list explain all this? I, I like um you know, cov- I like the last chart that they yeah, give there. there. It covers a bunch of different stuff. Um the quote the, the pullout quote is uh close followers of our research and other housing market indicators may be surprised to hear that the shelter component of CPI is up just five point five percent, which is actually now five point eight percent, compared to the um compared to inflation after all our national rent index spiked by 15.3 percent from and that's gone slightly down but the point is they are measuring rents at much higher than cpi's measuring rents and you can see it in this chart here they've got it at what uh 15.3 or something you know yeah. something a little bit Even lower higher. probably now you know, but you know and when you would your opinion matt be that um apartment list in typically has higher rates of rent growth for sure um, yes. than our other sources. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're all, they're a little bit on the high end, and I, and I was actually surprised to to learn that they were actually under. So from from uh, from the spring of 2021 on backwards to January 2018 in this chart, the apartment list prediction or uh, the apartment list numbers were lower than the CPI numbers. Yeah. Now they're way higher, but it's but it hasn't always been that way, which um, does I think it does lend credence to the idea that the CPI numbers are a lagging indicator and things are happening that have not yet shown up in the CPI figures. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when things are moving so quickly, it's like, you know, that was, that was literally quite yeah. literally yesterday's news. For like, and sure. we're, like that was yesterday, <laughs> today's today. And, you know, because again, last month, you know, oil is at 130. Now it's around 100. That's a big difference. Yeah. You know, that that's a big change in energy price. Doesn't mean gas is cheap because there's still issues with the uh, you know refineries, but it's down. Mm-hmm. And commodity prices, um, you know, grains, corn, all of that's come down. So it's going to be a pretty different picture next month. But to your point, Matt, I mean, rent makes rent uh, it makes up about 30 percent plus or minus of CPI. Yeah. So you know, there's a it's a big chunk that. In, really according to this data has been weighing down those cpi numbers it'll be interesting how it kind of equalizes 
um, yeah. next month. I mean, in core, I, I think I've said this earlier, core CPI, which takes out food and energy prices, it is about at parity with rent growth. And if rent growth, which I projected to do, uh, is going to show up even more in the next CPI report, compare that to core, it's going to out, it's going to exceed it. It's going to start really driving it. Yeah. And uh, I think we'll start hearing even more than we're already hearing. And it's just been increasing. So again, just staying on kind of rent growth in uh, multifamily market. You already put out their monthly national multifamily report for June 2022. There's always a great great report that Yardy does. Yeah. Um, we, we feature it every time that it comes out. Um, it really, I, I guess, Matt, kind of bring us in. They make some really, mm -hmm. they make some good, just kind of general executive um, overview points. But um, yeah, I like yeah, I how, your summary. I like how they characterize it a little bit. I mean, it, it's, it rolls, no, it's rolling along. It's rolling along. It's oh. not cooling off. It's rolling it's just along. Rolling. Um, it, it continues to be quite strong in, in 2022. Yardy Matrix records a 13.7 year over year change in rents for the month of June. Um, just compare that to the apartment list numbers was in the 15s. Um, still quite high. Year over year rent growth is down only 0.2% from last month. So really not much of a cool down. Still pretty dang high. Um, this report shows that... <laughs> I'm sorry, that this report shows such elevated in growth, uh, rent growth is a strong indication, I think, of the resilience of the apartment market during a time when so much of the economy has been unstable or trending downward. I, I, it's a little bit frustrating, and I think you've heard it, to, <laughs> you've heard the tone of my voice, to see that the hand-wringing about, about the trajectory of rents in 2022, um, how, how, much, how much anxiety people have when you put our current rent growth in line with historical levels. It just it just seems, you know, kind of ridiculous. Um, Yardy Matrix is recording a little more rent growth in CoStar, but I wouldn't say that Yardy Matrix's figures are less accurate or less representative of, of the market um, than CoStar's just because Yardy's rent growth numbers are higher. Um, I just think that it can be so easy to slip into a way of thinking that carries the recession fears and economic worries into the multifamily market. And reports like this one from Yardy Matrix have been, have been a consistent reminder of the real bust fundamentals of the multifamily market. Um, it's At this point, it's a lot easier for me to see changes in the multifamily market as a result of shifting investor demand and like purchaser demand rather than changes as a result of shifting renter demand. Do you think though that um, just because you know this data from Yardy definitely is la is lagging it's like this is what's this is what happened in june you mm -hmm. know with rents and people were seeing a lot of their these big increases for the first time it's not everyone got the had the rent increase last year in 2021 even though that was mm -hmm. the big story again that was the market rents and it wasn't until halfway through more than halfway through 2021 that, that some property managers and owners started catching up and raising their market rents but they had all these in place rents that were still relatively lower but this year apartment residents and tenants are being hit with larger than normal renewal rates and I, you know, with the uh, wages are growing, but we may be approaching that time period of where people are squeezing. You can't get it. I mean, people just aren't going to put up with um, a, another, you know, $50, $100, $200, $1,000 yeah. rent increase. And those are just, those are well, some anecdotes, some not, but I mean, that's, those are the levels that rents have been uh, raised and without some wage growth or some volatility and increased vacancy and turnover. Um, you know, you can say you can only squeeze so much blood out of a turnip. And uh, is there any more to squeeze? I don't know. Yeah, Maybe. well, you know, this is this is how markets work. And this is like, this is the, I said it before, it's like the high prices as a cure for high prices. And, and it seems like that it's, a, like I said, normalizing. It's not, there hasn't been such, uh, like a huge shock to the market. The way that it's trending isn't, isn't dipping down suddenly. To, to normalize, we, we have to see some major deceleration and, you know, some major, major deceleration. Um, we're not seeing major deceleration, but yeah. that, you know, that will, that is, it will be normal, but it's going to look bad. Well, it'll look a little bit. Occupancies are going to be declining. Yeah. You even see rent, you know, decrease or at least flat or go down slightly mm -hmm. and the rent, you know, the, the growth numbers are going to come down. Um, yeah. It's not going to look good, even though that historically and nor we're still doing better than normal. Yeah, I got to take. Yeah, I got to take myself out of the historical because it does look great if you're looking at the three year. But I feel like a lot of what, like I said earlier, a lot of uh, buyers and sellers have have a little bit of blinders on. They can only see like 2021 and, yeah. and this year and they're yeah. not really looking at the context. But I, I, I think that the rate of movement, it is it, the deceleration is slight enough 
where it could be leveling off. I it, even if it continues to, it's a little bit more of, of, of a predictable thing, and it could hopefully. But, be but it's like you know what the Fed things are. Like, what's the neutral rate? So what what yeah. is what is normal? Is it are is it um, three percent uh, annual rent growth and ninety five percent occupancy? Is that where we're going back to, or is it going? Are we is the new normal four percent five percent year yeah. over year rent growth and. 96 percent i can do which is where we're at right now or do we go back to 95 that's what's tough is you know what is that new long-term normal yeah. um because if we like some believe that we're going to be in a more inflationary environment than not that we're not going to see sub two percent um grow you know gdp growth over the next couple of years it's most likely going to be elevated in the kind of the three to four percent range and okay. inflation going to be in a similar kind of three to four to five percent range well, if, if inflation is at four, rent growth is probably going to be at least four, if not six. Yeah. Um, but is you know, but the, if the it, it'll be interesting. And again, you know, the Fed can try to get to that that neutral rate, you know, all they all they want. But it's, are they going to have the right tools um, to get there? If not, will it just persist? Uh, yeah, yeah. I uh, it's it's hard it's hard to make a, a prediction right now. I I think that. We we noted this a couple weeks ago. We're at an, we're at a little bit of an inflection point. Yeah. Um. But I I still don't think it's going to be a, a blink if you miss it kind of thing. We will we'll see it coming whether it's the trends in um, in occupancy and rents or <laughs> maybe maybe not so much the the Federal Reserve. But I, I believe so. Vladimir Len- Lenin had uh, there's a quote. Um. There are decades where nothing happens. Yeah. And then there are weeks where decades happen. Yep. Or that's a close. I don't know. It's Feeling a lot like one of those weeks. It, it, it's. It, we've, I feel like we've had a couple, a couple yeah. of those weeks, and with the last decade, and and that that was, um, you know, things like you know the euro and dollar, you know, parity, and this type of rent growth and inflation moving up. I mean, there have this has been a year or so where decades have taken place, mm-hmm. and really the last decade, um, not that things, you know, obviously things happened, um, but. In terms of you know where growth was going, it was pretty relatively stagnant um, and just kind of chugging, you know, really rolling along, chugging along at relatively yeah. low, moderate levels. And now it's just the f- switch has been flipped, and the the meteor has like splashed into the yeah. ocean, and like the tidal waves are just rolling through. And there's just multiple, multiple you know peaks and troughs of that yeah. shock wave it reacts and, and, and it goes back and, yeah and we're trying to figure out where are we and it's like is it things coming out is like the water started to calm yet or are we still going to get another one of those waves and um you know the smart assuming that the board of the federal reserve board of governors i feel like we, we beat up on those guys all the time but like <laughs> drive they're at least tending to drive so much of the economy but assuming and we'll give them credit of being incredibly smart people that know more than we do that uh, have much longer pedigrees in in economics and have teams of researchers and and analysts they they don't know and now they Mm -hmm. have to make decisions that affect everybody where they can't make sound conclusions and they've consistently been incorrect so we can make predictions here all day all all we want yeah i think the only thing we can do is say we don't we don't know and how do we prepare for a variety of um yeah eventualities i, I one of the things that i was going to note earlier in that first article about inflation is how we know that we know what's going to happen we know probably what the fed's going to do but you'll still see you know, in the market economists you know uh, ceos and, and all the people that are trading stocks from individuals to institutions they kind of expect what the fed's going to do but there's still going to be a uh, uh, there's still going to be a market reaction to to the announcement, and the question is, yeah. what can we do now? Okay, we know, and we know we're going to see that that thing. What what can we do? And and it, it, it's times like these where I really am appreciative that we're in the multifamily industry because at least we are insulated a little bit from those reactionary forces. Yeah, it's a little bit sm- slow moving. It's like kind of um, you're playing. Do you ever play the uh, Matrix video game that came out in like the mid two thousands and like you, or I guess yeah mid mid two thousands and like you could put on like a uh, like focus mode like everything slows yeah, down yeah, yeah. And, you, and you can kind of you know you could, all of a sudden you can kind of manipulate do all these moves. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like seeing things going in slow motion because real estate just me moves at such like a glacial pace yeah. that maybe you can kind of 
react and move quickly quickly while others are moving slowly very good point one example i mean this uh, was two months ago or so that you know like we issued that letter um mm -hmm. you know saying like hey these are our concerns not necessarily not with multifamily fundamentals but what the federal reserve is going to do because of inflation we see the fed funds futures and the dot plots of where rates may go it hasn't happened yet but it's been pretty well communicated yeah. that it, it could and it's like so, so what steps can you take steps that we took were okay instead of taking out a bridge loan with a variable interest rate that is going to have a two we probably got a three-year term but that interest rate at acquisition looks low it's you know kind of in the, in the low threes mid threes but that was when um sofer and the fed funds rate was essentially at zero right point zero five well, now we're over, you know, we're at 1.21, it could go up to three. So in that interest rate of around 3% that you thought you were going to be paying, all of a sudden you're paying a six or 7% interest rate versus what we did. We said, we're not going to go the bridge loan route, even though that had a higher potential return, like without a doubt, we went with a fixed rate option, lower loan to value. Um, we were able to execute it, get more interest only, but we have eliminated interest rate risk for the duration of that investment. And we're paying a much lower lower rate. We locked in at like 4.4% rather than seeing our interest rate being 6% or 7% yeah. potentially by the end of this year. So, you know, yeah, we were trading some short-term flexibility and, you know, a higher leverage in this type of environment. If there are quality assets to acquire, but the risk is high, it's how do you, how do you execute by mitigating risk, yeah. quantifying it and mitigating it so you can still allocate and acquire, you know, incredible assets that are going to continue to appreciate and throw off cash flow, but you do it in a way that doesn't open yourself open yourself up and expose you to unnecessary risk mm -hmm. when, you know, it's just the markets are jo jostling around. It's like, you know, the last decade or so, you know, it's again calm waters. You don't necessarily need, you know, uh, you know, a seafaring vessel that you know has got a high bow and a nice you know, a a wide beam and um you can you can just you can hit every storm you didn't need that you could just go out on a, your pleasure cruiser yeah. have a good time all good everybody's making money now you see storm clouds gathering now we still need to get out there because there's still good opportunities but you gotta take the right freaking vessel yeah you know it's like hey time to batten down the hatches still go forward there's still objectives to achieve there's still opportunity out there but you have to do it in a way where you're not going to get yourself sunk when you're trying to accomplish your goal of acquiring some quality assets that are going to appreciate over time and they're off cash flow yeah and I, so. and i still think that there is uh that the, the knowledge is out there to make those decisions um i was gonna say you know i think the the fed has a lot of hidden mandates but i think one of them is to not surprise people um and yeah. and all the all the predictions of people nothing is come out of the blue and so you know kind of armed with this knowledge and armed with really this uh like, like a, a an attitude mm -hmm. then you can then you can really make some sound decisions and 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 come out of this a lot better than you would otherwise yeah yeah all right well you know i think we're going to continue to beat the fed up uh beat, right. him, beat him to death but <laughs> hey, if you find this type of conversation interesting make sure you're subscribed to the great capital youtube channel and you're also getting the podcast which is basically this show but in podcast form you can listen to it on your car ride or while you're working out um but obviously you get the full video experience or showing graphs here on youtube so make sure you're subscribed leave a comment especially if you disagree we'd love to cover it Give us a like. That helps the algorithm. It shows other people, hey, here's some content that you may be interested in because Mr. Person yourself that is watching this, they thought it was a good idea as well. If you are an accredited investor and, you're, and you think, okay, I kind of like what these guys are saying. They're not being too aggressive. You know, we're like, we want to buy something, but we're trying to be as smart as possible about it, not trying to catch a bottom knife. When there's an opportunity, I'd love to do, I would love to partner with these guys. Again, if you are an accredited investor, you can go to gray.fund to learn more about the Gray Fund, which is Gray Capital's investment vehicle to invest in stabilized, cash flowing multifamily assets. We're talking institutional quality deals. A first uh, asset of 140 units, the second asset is 406 units. We're building a portfolio of seven to 10 individual properties, all put in one just robust portfolio conservatively throwing off cash flow not hardly any interest inter no interest rate exposure on the first two deals 
Um, if that sounds interesting to you, we'd love to partner with you. Hop on over to greatcapitalllc.com or gray.fund to learn more. You can follow Matt and I on LinkedIn, other social channels. You know where to find us. Love to talk to you. Any closing remarks, mar- remarks, man? Not to put you on the spot, but uh, what's up? Oh no, I'm just. I didn't ask you. I didn't ask you before the show how your <laughs> know, day was going. Right. Uh, you know, I'm just ready for another interesting week. That's another decade. I think I can handle another decade. Another, another decade. Another week. Another decade. All right. We'll yeah. see you on next week's great report.